So, um, hello everyone. I hope everyone's suitably recaffeinated this morning and uh, ready to get back at it. So, uh, yeah, what a tremendous lineup of speakers we've heard this morning so far. And uh, I'm really excited about this next segment here because um, I've uh, never had an opportunity to be a chair of a conversation before. So I'm very much used to being part of the furniture of this place, but I've never been a chair. So that's, that's going to be a new experience for me. So yeah, what a cracking conversation that we have lined up here and in store for you for this ne next segment just before lunch. Um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Rosie Wayne and Don Robson Bell, some of the foremost minds, movers and shakers in their respective fields of tartan. So, Don Robson Bell uh, studied textile design at uh, Heriot Watt University and after graduating took on a temporary role at Le Caron. And also that is located within the Scottish borders, I should say. So 30 years later, Don is now managing director of Le Caron and it is arguably the world's leading manufacturer in tartan. So, and now it goes without saying that uh, Le Caron's mark is peppered throughout the exhibition as well. So Somewhat, I did yes. see you come in yesterday with uh, a long list of uh, all the potential clients that have been yes, listed throughout exactly. the show. And um, yeah, without further ado, Dr. Rosie Wayne is a fashion historian and curator based in Scotland. Rosie specialises in the history of tartan, highland dress and the material world of Jacobitism. Graduating with a PhD in history from the University of Southampton, her research explores uh, the romantic representations of Scotland and Scottishness within contemporary media. And Rosie was also a key advisor to the exhibition here in Dundee. And the show really wouldn't be what it is today without her time and attention given to it as well. So yeah, oh, a big you. thank you to yourself. <laughs> um, so I do have this wee slide clicker here. Um, probably going to be bouncing back and forward because uh, I do understand that your slides are first, but the way I've sort of structured, structured this conversation is uh, many um, sort of questions between back and forward. So we're going to go all over the place with this conversation today, folks. So uh, I thought I'd start off. Um, we've called this section here um, reinvention. And this is alluding, of course, to Hugh Trevor Roper's infamous critical text uh, in Hobsbawm's invention of tradition. And this is a text that you're probably rather familiar with, I'm Rosie, yes. <laughs> from your research and producing the excellent publication that is Highland Style. So uh, could you walk us through this period of apparent invention or reinvention of Highland tradition and dress? Mm -hmm. And I'll see if I can click forward to then find your slides as well. Um, so I have just finished a five-year project with National Museum of Scotland to reassess our uh, Highland dress and tartan collections, very much to answer this question of invention or reinvention. Um, there is, there has been this perception driven largely during the 1980s by people like uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, that during the mid 19th century, there was this explosion of fanciful invention around tartan and that you know, everything we know about tartan is false and blah. Um, but actually, when you go back to the material evidence in the museum's collections and in other museum collections and private collections around Scotland and elsewhere, what you actually see is a very slow, organic growth of tartan as we understand it today, driven by things, of course, like commercial, um, commercial drive from famous weavers like Messrs Wilson and Bannockburn, who are one of the largest producers of um, Scottish tartans from the 1750s, 60s, um, into the 19th century. They are responsible for things like a lot of clown tartans, um, but they're also responsible for things like fashion tartans and tartans for places and specific people, or as we were <laughs> talking about the last week, um, customers who just wanted to create tartans very much for their own identity creation. So one of my favorite things from the National Museum of Scotland's collection is this drawing which was submitted by a customer to Messrs. Wilson of Barnet Burn in 1812. And it was from this guy who was a Scot, but he wasn't a Highland Scot, but he'd just bought a Highland estate and he'd just become a member of the Highland Society of London. And he wanted to create a tartan basically for his servants to wear when he was on his Highland estate. And he was very particular about what he wanted. And this is the culmination of many letters uh, and samples sent to the weaver 
And what I really love about this is it kind of flies in the face of that invented tradition idea in a lot of ways. It's not so much the weaver dictating to the market, this is what tartan is and this is what it will always be. It's the customer participating in that and sharing in that story of identity making. Um, I think it's quite interesting the parallels we can draw between this kind of yeah. and, you know, customer and weaver back and forth and story making, identity making and the sort of thing that Le Caron does. Yeah. We yes, that's, yeah, because that's a great time to actually bring yourself in, Dawn, because, of course, a lot of that's probably ringing through. And, um, yeah, does this sound very familiar to what drives clients now today as well when it comes to design and very much, Very much so. Um, we talked last week when we had a little bit chat about what we would go over. There's a not, not a lot of change, but a huge amount of change, and more of that change is in terms of technology, speed, globalisation, etc., we find with a lot of customers that we're working with, they'll maybe, they do identify with tartan. Global brands really identify with tartan. Um, so Scots were very canny in taking a check and making it their own. Now our customers want to make it their own as well. And they may well start with a classic tartan. It goes into the collection. Their customers start, in, start to associate tartan with them, or certainly checks and they find they have to come back season after season, whether they want to or not. Most of them do want to, um, and they'll maybe keep using that tartan. They might take something different and add it to the collections. And we will then eventually start that conversation. Why don't you have your own tartan? Or they come and say, can we do something that then becomes unique to us? And it's often a collaboration. They'll come in with ideas, we give them ideas. The invention of CAD design systems obviously revolutionised what we could do and how fast we could do it which in the fashion era is important. Everything has to be yesterday, not tomorrow. So CAD design systems allowed us to very quickly put lots of information together, lots of designs together, get them out of the customer, and then that conversation goes back. They like this, they don't like that. Prior to that, we would have to weave something every time, which was very, very costly. And no mills in the eight, from the 80s onwards ever had what they called a pattern room literally looms dedicated solely to weaving patterns. Um, but as, as Rosie says, it's not changed, really, because we can see that going back to the, the interaction that Wilson's and Bannockbane had, and we're still having that interaction with clients today. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because, of course, you're then thinking about that sort of means and ways of communication between the client and the weaver and... Um, I guess that's a lot what you, you've uncovered within your research, looking at the Wilson's of Bannockburn correspondence as well, the different tools that are then used to communicate design um, between both. So is there any sort of name, namely examples that really stand out to you from your time researching this? Um, I mean, my favourite one is the one we just talked about. <laughs> but mm. um, yeah, what really struck me about working with the papers of Wilson's of Bannockburn at NMS um, is that the level of customer interaction in the creation of designs, where it be something like drawing what they want, very specifically and colouring it in and labelling it in that very meticulous way, um, or sending in uh, scraps of other um, fabrics with like colours that they would like. Or uh, with this particular one, uh, this is from uh, 1824, <laughs> and uh, it's from a merchant in New York, and he's very much working around the fashion seasons, which would go between Britain and, um, and America. And in this letter, he's sending basically the patterns from last season and saying he wants patterns which are like it, but not exactly the same as it. It's almost like, can you develop these patterns forward for me into what is now fashionable? So it's very much the retailer driven by his customers, which are driving that design process at the weaver's end. Um, and I find that really fascinating because, of course, the weavers, in a lot of ways, they are dictating what's on the shelves, but they're not doing it in this vacuum. They are listening. And I think that, that conversation is something that has been missed in a lot of scholarship that has come out about this process uh, in the last 50 years or so when Tarn's become very sexy. <laughs> um, and I think it's a really interesting avenue to, for us to pursue in future scholarship how this kind of thing links into what is happening in Tartan now, how there's almost that unbroken legacy of communication. Maybe we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've, 
obviously is one of the, the only manufacturers of tartan left in Scotland. There are others. I won't, you know, we're not just the only ones. But we have that, that ongoing conversation. And from, I mean, the best example of a design brand working with tartan is probably Vivian Westwood. Mm -hmm. And we started working with her in the mid-80s when the brand was really in its infancy. The association with tartan, it, it's crossed that boundary from being, you know, everything from the traditional, the very, you know, it goes into the military, it goes into schools as, as uniform. It's very, very traditional, very staid. And then you get the punk movement, which threw everything up on its head in the most recent way. Um, but Westwood's brand... They started again with the traditional tartans and very quickly we realised that there, are, there was a way of building on that. And they actually worked with us, they brought ideas, they had, they had samples from museum pieces that were to be developed and moved on and some of those designs they're, now, they're still using. I think we've worked with them virtually every year since the mid-80s with tartan. And that is now synonymous with their brand. Mm -hmm. um, and it's lovely that collaboration that we have with... The, the key people, I mean, mm -hmm. I met Vivian a lot of times, um, worked with a lot of her team, a lot of her team then moved to other places, and then that, con that continues the conversation with new brands. And ultimately, um, just tapping into that sort of relationship with Vivian Westwood, um, how did that sort of selection process say, you know, if they were designing a bespoke fashion tartan, um, but if they were wanting to use an existing tartan pattern, how did they sort of come to that decision? Sometimes it, it literally is on, on colour and, and pattern and scale and, and what fits with the season, a bit like you were saying with your customer wanting to move things with the season. Mm -hmm. Some brands have now become really well known because of the selection of tartans they work with. Comme de Garçon, you can guarantee there'll be a red tartan, a green tartan, well, a navy tartan and usually Loud MacLeod or something similar or a Barclay or a, or a very bright black and white graphic thing. So they'll, they'll work with something that they feel fits their particular image and brand. But equally, because most of tar the tartans are in the public domain, anybody else can use them. But it's the brand, their stamp on something that m brings that uniqueness to it. So you can have the same tartan in a Ralph Lauren collection looking extremely classic, and in a Comme des Garçons collection looking like, how on earth would you sit on an aeroplane wearing, like, wearing that? Mm -hmm. um, so it's great that it crosses all those boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I asked that as well, because I noticed you're sporting these fantastic shoes here today, yeah. which are in what I believe is the Dundee tartan, which is one yes, that Vivian are, Westwood yes. is commonly used. She, ha she uh, commonly time. uses that and Bruce of Canada. They're, they're mm -hmm. two of the key ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, um, reinventing a, a brand through different uh, tartan use is, you know, one motivation that really interests clients. Um, so what is it, uh, could you maybe elaborate more on the process of working with such a client, say, you know, from the first instance of an idea and then the things that they typically then look out for as they're sort of developing that tartan design? Some, it, it does vary from brand to brand and individual to individual. Some are much more collaborative than others. Some really just give you, we've had people, we worked with Missoni a number of years ago and uh, they actually, we were told we were getting something sent to us that they would like us to copy. They sent a painting, a, a really, painting. really abstract painting of mm. lines and colour going all over the place. And it was, it was a bit of a landscape in the background. And we were like, oh, this is going to be a tough one. Um, and Fiona, who was designing it with us at the time, we sat then, we just got the CAD system. We thought, right, well, what can we do with this? How can we achieve something for them? And... We just developed a printed yarn, which the colour was printed across the yarn, the, the actual fibre of the yarn. So it gave you, it went from orange to green to blue to red. So well, I could, because the painting was like that, it was just bonkers. <laughs> and we actually did a card of something that looked like a, a tartan or a check or a plaid. It was debatable at the time. <laughs> because the card system couldn't produce the, the printed yarn, we actually got... Karen Dash crayon, crayons, and we, we painted the colours, pencil colours. We also had a mohair yarn in there, which had a loop on it, so we drew loops. The scale was enormous. We, A3, I think we had about 12 A3 pages, selling tape together, 
really did not look professional. We rolled it up in a tube that you would normally roll fabric on, sent it out, and we got about 10, 000, 2,000 metres of cloth from it. Oh, and, mad. you know, that was thinking outside the box. CAD systems still have their limitations, and we still can't do some of those yarns. But that's where you want to achieve something with your customer. Um, you, we were lucky it worked. There are other projects that we've had to think about and think, no, these won't work. But we can generally come up with an alternative or a suggestion that you know, gives them that idea that, oh, we can get, I can't quite get that, but we can get this. And I love that as well, how it's then, you know, you, you saw the limitations of computer-aided design and then you brought it back to kind of that physical sort of drawing out, much yeah. like with much many of the like clients at Wilson's at Banning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, tartan is, a, you know, such an adaptable commodity now for fashion nowadays. Um, Rosie, how did Wilson's cloth make it into everyday wear uh, beyond Highland dress? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what are trade fancy tartans? Peter would probably be better fixed <laughs> to talk about this than I would be. Um, but in terms of what we can learn from the NMS collection in particular of, of correspondence is it is notable how a lot of the letters aren't necessarily talking about the tartan being for Highland dress. It'll be for things like uh, cloaks, women's dresses, uh, men's jackets, trousers. Um, it's very date dependent as well, because obviously tartan is very much enmeshed in the fashion of the 18th and 19th century, beyond Highland dress. So you can see it used in other things. But also what we have in the correspondence is a lot of, of the high quality tartans, um, but there are also coarser tartans and uh, less, less massively decorative tartans, which would have been used uh, for more everyday applications. Uh, it's not, so they had quite a, a large clientele in a lot of ways, like they're serving the great and the good. It's not just the fanciest people who are getting the tartan. Yeah. There are lots of different grades of it um, during this time period. Um, what was the other part of your question? Trade um, it was, um, and could you explain what uh, trade fancy uh, tartans are? Trade fancy tartans. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would interpret that as basically being tartans which were produced not necessarily without a name. Um, so there's one which NMS lent you guys for the exhibition, which I should have put a picture up of. Um, but it's a really beautiful, really complex, super fine tartan which contains loads of many different colours. It, it doesn't have a name or a number associated with it in, um, in the papers that we have, but it would have been basically just used as a fashion tartan. It's applicable to you know, any form of clothing, really. It doesn't necessarily have to be for Highland dress. And at that time when it was produced, I think the one that's in the exhibition is from 1790s, it sort of predates the, the big clam tartan push, even though clam tartans are, are milling around at this point. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, trade fancy tartans, they were still being produced alongside clam tartans for a time as well. And some of them would morph into clam tartans later on when Wilsons would, like, take patterns, which they would then be like, and now this is this pattern. Mm. And that's what's really fascinating to me about this era of tartan, is it's, it's pure experimentation. And I think that's what's sometimes lost when we're talking about tartan during this period. It's often seen as quite prescriptive, um, maybe because when we talk about tartan during this period, we're focusing on clans yeah. and forgetting everything else that's going on at the same time. I think that's really important when we look at tartan in that historical perspective, is to see it as part of that broader historical context. Um, and I hope that's something that um, my work has been able to, to help a little bit, but also perhaps that's something that can be driven forward in the new work that's going to happen with, with other people. Mm -hmm. um, the last year with NMS was focused on contemporary collecting, and what we really wanted to do there was try and capture what's going on in the industry right now so that we can have these very same conversations 50, 100 years yeah. down the line. Yeah. And we worked with Karen on that, <laughs> as well as others. Yeah, because it was, um, how many uh, elements were then collected as part of this new collecting? Um, so overall, we got <coughs> about eight outfits from different outfitters. We were focusing on the sort of Highland dress that is available to people on the high street, online. Um, and from weavers, we got um, the collection, a collection of material that had to do with the design of Haim, which is one of the Karen's uh, tartans, which includes... Um, 
if we can go to the CADs, just going back to Absolutely. that CAD idea. Um, this, what we were talking about earlier, the CAD system, the computer-assisted design uh, way of creating tartans now, it's really important for in the historical record way that we have things like the drawings and the designs from Wilson's in the 19th century, as well as these 21st century te technologically minded uh, way of designing tartans so that we get that down in the curated record of this. Um, so we worked with Lacaron to, to collect this sort of thing, as well as uh, Prickly Thistle in Scotland to show just <coughs> a completely different way of, of how weavers are working in this area as well. Sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> Love a good tangent. Yeah. So, yeah, but I think this is a good point to actually bring it back to, to markets as well. And in fact, um, of course, looking through Wilson's correspondence, you then get a, a good idea of uh, the international reach at the point as well. And I think this is a good time to actually introduce both as well um, over how important is representation of Scottishness with or against Britishness to international markets and brands today. Um, I'd love to get both of your thoughts on that mm -hmm. question. I think we've found that so many companies do, so many people now do just associate tartan with Scotland. Um, we do get asked occasionally to put a made in Britain Union Jack on things, which we decline. Um, <laughs> no, it's not quite British, it's Scottish. Uh, but they, they are much more aware that tartan is Scottish, and Scots have done an amazing job sort of putting it out there across the world. In particular, markets like the, the Japanese market, they have a real affinity with tartan. They love that whole history, whatever that is, and I'm not commenting, of tartan, <laughs> but they love that the fact that there is a tradition there, there is a story. Quite often they would like that story to be quite romantic when more or less a lot of the stories are quite brutal. Um, so we have to sort of gentrify things if we want to give them a, a slightly nicer version of the story of where that tartan or tartans came from. But they, they love that. Um, they recognise it's Scottish. They recognise it's got a story. We hope they buy from Scotland. Um, not just us, others are available. But also, it, they generate, it generates so much interest in Scotland, mm -hmm. like the whisky, the golf, etc., we design tartans for Japanese schools because they're still very keen on uniforms. Um, we have a licensee that we work with out there. So it, it really keeps pushing that notion of tartan and what it, it's all about. And it helps bring the visitors back into Scotland. I mean, obviously, any, any country where we have Scottish ancestry or this, I can't say that word, dias, diaspora? Yes. Diaspora, that's diaspora. it. You know, obviously, <laughs> American and Canadians, we have mm. a lot of clients out there. Um, but the French love it. The French wear it so beautifully and chic. They, you know, they put on a tartan tam hat and you're like, oh, it's nice, <laughs> isn't it? You know, I put one and go, oh my God, <laughs> never. Um, but the, the French and the Italians, the, the Germans, we have. I actually have customers in the Netherlands. The, the Dutch love tartan. We have a lot of Dutch tartans now, um, and they they need generally more than eight yards for a kilt because they usually rather large people and very tall, so it's got to be quite long as well. So it has really spread and, and it is appreciated and people want to take it forward, not just work in the past, but look at how they can develop tartans with us or with mm -hmm. other design brands so that it becomes unique to them mm -hmm. and it, it kind of, their customers associate it with that, that brand. I mean, we've got numerous, ident numerous customers and like the Xbox that you've got in, involved that. yeah. that's introduced tartan to a whole other generation that never leave their bedrooms basically because they're doing that or whatever <laughs> you do on a box but it, it's amazing how it crosses. Speaking from experience over here so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why you got into all of this isn't it? <laughs> yeah um, but no, no that's, uh, that's grand so that's actually you know how you can see how charities, uh, corporate collective identity, that's how you actually manufacture authenticity in a sense, and I guess you know that's you know what what then makes a tartan you know real and authentic, which mm. was the, of course the terminology that started appearing in mm. the early nineteenth century. And I do recognise we've only got one minute left, so <laughs> I'll let Rosie get a word in before I turn it around to questions. So, um, yeah. just on the the last question, we were talking about um, that international reach of tartans. Something I find is most noticeable in is something like the Scottish Register of Tartans, where you see tartans coming in from all over the world. Um, and I think that 
I just think that's fascinating. And I love how almost democratised tartan has become in the like late, late 20th, 20, early 21st century, how that bringing of digital and that interconnectedness um, has brought so many new designs out into the world. Not all of them get woven, obviously, and used, but that, that process of identity making, I think, is fantastic. Yeah, well, great. So I think that's us at the end of the discussion anyway. It zooms by so quickly, and there's so much more I would have loved to have actually just sit down and talk here, but this is a, a really great time uh, to actually turn to the audience here and ask if there's any questions, because it's a really rare chance we have here to stop and tap into your respective knowledges. So I do know that uh, Lizzie's going to be going around with a Roman mic, and I will ask if uh, you can say who you are and where you fit as well when uh, you ask your questions. So that would be grand. Hi there, um, my name is Regan and I am just across the water in Fife. Um, my question would be, how many um, tartans would you say that are new to you are woven on average per year? I wouldn't <laughs> like to say how many, but I would say fewer are woven than mm -hmm. aren't. Fewer are woven than aren't woven, yeah. There is a, there is a lot that go through the design process um, and for registration as well with the Scottish Register of Tartans, but won't ever be manufactured. Oh, question over here. Oh. Just going to say quickly as well, for those online, our chat is back up and running, so if anybody online has any questions, do fling them at us. Hiya. Um, Talika Kirkland from London, uh, UL, Costume Institute of the African Diaspora. Hi, Dawn and Rosie. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, Dawn, I wanted to ask you about um, Burberry. <laughs> <laughs> Only because you mentioned about... Um, the guy on the plane and the, the particular notion of someone being dressed in a tartan, well, a check as well. Um, and, oh my God, I'd never wear that. And there's this whole thing about the Burberry check and how it was associated with people of a particular socioeconomic demographic and how they completely removed the idea of it being so associated with those people so they could kind of reclaim it for themselves. So I kind of wanted to ask you about this idea of using a tartan as a way of um, re-establishing and distancing a kind of class um, aesthetic, because I think that's kind of what Burberry has done with their own check and kind of tried to distance it from people who have been considered uh, less than desirable. I'm not going to use the word that has been used for them, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, I think certainly the Burberry check is very unique and it is quite contentious in terms of they appropriated what was a Thompson tartan um, and made it their own, but then other people have taken tartan and made it their own without necessarily wanting it to remain unique to them. Um, we do work with Burberry, we have worked with them on and off over the years, uh, not as a major supplier. I think they took it and made it unique and made it aspirational in some respects. Um, it came from workwear to start with, that the brand came from a workwear background and then they, they, they moved that and elevated that brand into what it became. But then it did work against them as well because there was that whole period of time in, in the 90s when the Burberry check was seen as really, it, 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 it was, the word chav came about. And yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it, it did, it literally went everywhere. Everybody wanted it and everybody had it and everybody that could make it, tried to make it and did make it. And maybe it's what, you know, in hindsight, if Burberry had been less precious about it, they might not have had that as a problem in terms of their branding. Yeah. Grand. Cool. Um, uh, oh, one more question. Pretty please, Lizzie. One more. And then uh, we'll move on. Uh, just in the audience over here. Would you mind passing it on for me? 
Hi, um, my name is Meha. I'm a historian at the University of Edinburgh, and thank you all for a great discussion. Um, I actually just want to um, follow up on Talika's question, and maybe um, since you've asked a contemporary question about class, could Rosie maybe speak a bit more about tartan and social status and class? And I'm thinking of your example of the of your favorite example, but it was for his servants, right, yeah. as you mentioned. And so, like, and the relationship for someone who's being forced, let's say, or being asked to wear something. And so what does that do for their relationship with Tartan in that period, if we're then later imagining it as a very national kind mm -hmm. of... Yeah, I think during the time that this design was created, Tartan is going through a period of, of great elitism, um, particularly the kind of tartan that Wilson's became known for making, which was very high quality uh, and would include things like silk in it and that kind of stuff. Um, they were also producing lower, lower grade tartans and tartans for the military and stuff like that. But I think the overarching sort of feeling out of this period is it's, it's for the elite and for the upper class. And I think that held on for a very long time during the Victorian into the early 20th century. And it was only really during the 20th century that I think there's, there's more of a, a democratisation of tartan across different classes. Um, as for the making his servants wear it, I find that very uncomfortable in a lot of ways, particularly because he's making it, making it for his servants who are working on his Highland estate, which he has just acquired as a lowlander Scot. So it, it is uncomfortable, I think. And... It's a very, very complex question, <laughs> which I'd love to talk to you about in more detail because it's, it, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. that's a great I way mean, to round off, in fact, because I'm sure we'll oh. continue these conversations over our lunch. So um, I'd like to thank you both again for sitting down with me for this wee chat anyhow, and yeah, we'll continue on with it. So yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dawn and Rosie, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. So, yeah. so now I know our next presentation surrounds a story that helped put the exhibition on the map across Britain and even internationally. Uh, the Glen Affric textile was a discovery in the latter days of the project and readily became a key object within Tartan and the Grid. Here to present on recent research into the textile is Peter Islia MacDonald. Peter is an internationally recognised tartan historian. He's been studying and researching tartan for the past, oh, thank you very much, for the past 40 years and is a leading authority on 18th and 19th century patterns and techniques. He's a self-taught hand weaver and he's also head of research at the Scottish Tartans Authority. Uh, and he's demonstrated and lectured widely. So without further ado, Peter, I'd like to welcome you up to the podium to give your presentation. Thank you. if we have that the right way up. Good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, I'm conscious I've got the pre-lunch shift, so um, I will try and not overrun. Um, this, I, I've known about this textile for, since the mid-1980s. Um, it has sat, or it sat in the collection of the Scottish Tartans Authority for most of its uh, existence that we've known about it, simply because, in broad terms, it's pretty uninteresting. Um, in, in, if you're thinking about tartan, because tartan's nice, it's, bright, and it's got colours in it, and there's colours in it, but it's got reds and greens, etc. As part of the exhibition prep, um, I, I know they were hoping to have an early piece of tartan. I know there was talk about perhaps having the Falkirk tartan, of which more are non, or, or even perhaps one of the pieces from China. Um, but neither of those were possible. And James said to me, I think fairly close to the, the opening, you don't, you, the Scottish Tartans Authority, don't happen to have a piece of proto-tartan in your collection, do you? Ah, I said, well, just so happens that we do. So this is the, uh, the fragment which you probably have all seen uh, in the collection. James, can I just check? We've got, oh, we have got a good. Um, <clears throat> so I say, We've known about it for about um, well, the mid-1980s. Um, the Tartan Authority's predecessor, the, Tartan, the Scottish Tartan Society, um, this was handed in to them in a plastic bag in the mid-1980s. It came from some forestry work up in Glenafric. 
uh, which is uh, up in the northwest, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, um, handed in by a couple of guys. It had been found doing, say, some forestry work. Uh, we have little other information about it, but it clearly, uh, having worked with textiles for a long time, I felt that it was much older than many of the oldest pieces of tartan that I had worked with over the past 40 years or something. I felt instinctively it was pre-1700, so pre-18th century. Uh, most, if not all, of the surviving pieces of tartan in collections, nationally and in private collections, are from the beginning, or post the beginning of the 18th century. So it's uh, an unusual outlier. So, there we go. So Glen Afric, for those that don't know it, Here's Inverness at the top here. So that's 100 odd miles north of um, where we are now and slightly uh, west. Glen Afric is a glen of approximately 30 miles long and it sits, it, it's long been a transit route between the west coast, so Loch Alsh, etc., right the way across through here to uh, Loch Ness and then up into Inverness. Uh, by long, I mean um, prehistory, so the last two, three thousand years, people have used that as a route, which is quite important. Um, what was interesting and somewhat frustrating about um, the fragments when it was uh, handed in to us, the attribution process at the time of the society, which was a volunteer society, there was not a lot of good record keeping at the time. Um, I don't even have the name of the person who handed it in and certainly not exactly where in the Glen, and that's quite important. So, I say Glen Affric. Here, uh, Glen Affric's been, uh, is arguably the most beautiful Glen in Scotland. Um, there's been a lot of work to reforest it, uh, so it's got a lot of native Scots pine, etc. Uh, on here, you can see, and this is slightly later work, so this is from the 1990s, um, but you can see here, uh, the red, if I'm right in saying, is where they were doing work to reforest it. <clears throat> the green is where they're trying to do natural regeneration. But that's just some of the areas um, at the top of the glen. Actually, the forestry went, work went right on the whole length of the glen. Uh, why that's important, you get an idea here. You can see when they were doing reforestation, they put through a huge plough, mega plough. Basically, it's a great big plough drag behind a tractor, which is significant in terms of the find here. So not only do we know not, uh, not only do we not know where it was found, it could have been any one of these red areas or indeed any other area that they had done this to, but the circumstances, you, you, those who have seen it will recognize that it's roughly rectangular but quite ragged, raggedy, um, that the machine that did this means that it could, that when it was found, it could have been 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 meters from where it actually was turned up. So that's what we don't know. Um, there is no record of any other artifacts or body items or anything else like that associated with it. Um, actually, it's quite often the case with things like this, which are demonstrably old, that people choose not to look terribly hard because it tends to slow down the process of what they're wanting to do. So as I say, all we know is that it was turned up in something like this, but exactly where we don't know. Nonetheless, it is remarkable that someone had the foresight to hand it in, in their plastic bag, and, and give it to um, the Tartan Society, for which we are enormously grateful. The textile itself, oh, there's the, the uh, just shows you the old route from the west coast right through to the um, <coughs> the east, so I, from Loch Alsh through to uh, Loch Ness on the right-hand side, and you can see it passes through all those areas where they were doing that forestry work. So again, people going through that route from the last two or three thousand years. The textile itself <coughs> um, is a 2 2 twill weave, so a standard twill weave as you would use for tartan. Um, it's woven with singles, i.e. a non-plied non yarn, um, quite loosely but very evenly spun. Um, beautifully done, it's at about 10 ends per centimetre. So it's quite loose, it's not actually as loose as it appears there. You can see the, the, uh, the magnification there. This was part of the dye analysis that was done uh, by the National Museum of Scotland, uh, and with that they did some fantastic close-up photography for us as well. <clears throat> but it gives you a really good idea 
of the techniques and capabilities of people at whatever date this was. As I say, I'd always felt that it was pre-1700. The other interesting thing about uh, the specimen is we are very fortunate that on one edge there are fragments for selvage. So we can see, we know instantly which way the, it was woven, that way, that's your warp there, weft going across the way. Um, but to have elements of a selvage was fantastic because we get um, some idea of the width. Obviously, we don't have one there, so we don't know how far that went, but it gives you an idea, and I say more importantly, it gives you the direction of weave, etc. Um, <clears throat> and what's also particularly interesting, let me step back a second here, you can see in here that although it's quite dark and there's been a lot of peat staining, you can see in there stripes of colour superimposed on it, and there are stripes of differing colours and of different proportions, which is one of the ways that I would differentiate that from the so-called folk so tartan. Um, so we've got, uh, as I say, we've got uh, a selvage. The other interesting thing about the selvage is that it has a binding thread on it that is a plied yarn. That's the only piece of plied yarn on there. Um, and whether that was done as a strengthening stitch or it indicated that there was originally, it was a joined piece, I don't know. There is certainly no evidence of, if you like, fragments on that piece that suggest another piece was, was, was um, joined to it, but it could have been. We, we don't know, as I say, so little about it. But it's just interesting from my perspective, as I say, you've got a very um, fine, Hand, um, finely woven twill weave cloth um, with singles, but then they've chosen to use, for whatever reason, either for strengthening or for joining this um, uh, plied binding thread. And it would have been interesting had we had the other selvage to see if it had been on both sides. But we don't, and indeed whether it's gone all the way around. So as I say, we, um, we the Tartan Authority, as Part of the loan process, we thought, well, it, actually, here's an opportunity to test the theory that I had, that it was older than um, 1700. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing we did was approach the National Museum of Scotland to do the dye analysis for us, um, which um, took about, I think it was about 12 weeks uh, of fantastic work on their part. I say particularly, oops, sorry, come back, particularly to... Um, provide these fantastic photographs um, that allow a, a, a really good detailed study of it. You can see in here some of the different colours of the yarn. So here we can see, this is obviously not just natural colour fleece because sheep don't come in green, not in Scotland anyway. Um, <clears throat> and we have green, we have a sort of yellow, we have brown, and there's a, a red yarn in here as well. Um, the brown yarn may be a natural coloured fleece. So it may not be a brown dye, it may be a natural colour fleece, but the rest of it, uh, it all involves dye stuffs. Um, and so there are your individual yarns, uh, colours there. So we've got uh, green, I think I'm right, right, green, red, yellow and the brown. What really blew my mind about this is the fineness of it um, and the quality of the, uh, the yarn. There's almost no kemp in this. For those that know what Kemp is, it's the bits that go white in your hair as you get older. Um, it's the bits that you find in unimproved fleece. So you get, on Harris Tweed, you get bits that pull out that, that don't take the dye. That's Kemp. There's almost no Kemp in this at all. Um, it, in many ways, this looks like the fibres of nylon when it's, when it's produced under, looked under, under a microscope. Fantastic stuff. Um, so what does that tell us? It was probably a high quality fleece or several fleeces. They probably plucked the best parts of um, the wool from several fleeces to make this. And it just <clears throat> talks to probably the end use of this and the, the uh, social status of the person it was made for. Let's see, four colours that were identified as part of the Dye analysis. <clears throat> the dye analysis told us had to be done, but it uh, and it, if you like, confirmed what I felt I knew, but it confirmed. There we are. Oh, here's, here's just show you where the dye was taken from. So, in order to do the dye analysis, we, they took areas from or sections from different areas in order to make sure that there was no just you know contamination in one area. And that was the results we got. So the green, unsurprisingly, was a combination of an indigotin, a blue, and an unnamed yellow. There's a red, but the 
both the red and the yellow, there, is, there was not enough of the, let's call it residue for want of a better word, to be able to calibrate what dye stuff that was, but it was demonstrably a, the color there. And so we've got yeah, red, yellow, and, uh, so green, red, yellow, and brown, which as I say, was possibly a natural colored fleece. But that gives you uh, an idea of um, the dyes involved. <clears throat> so I say, what that told me um, with the uh, analysis of that was that there were no artificial colors involved. So it's pre-1856. I sort of knew that already. And more importantly, there were no imported dyes. And I should caveat that by I'm talking about imported hardwood dyes from North America, which means it's pre-1750, 1770, something like that. Again, I already knew that, but that had to be done in order to prove the point, so to speak. Um, oh, some of the other fantastic uh, electron microscope um, images of the different yarns. I think we've got the, if I remember rightly, that's the yellow and the red there. But again, <clears throat> there's further work to be done on studying this to look at the fleece breeds, potentially. So all that told us was what colours were, were involved in, in the piece, but nothing about the age. Um, I hadn't even realised you could carbon date it in Scotland, um, but you can. Um, there are four places, in the, three places in the UK that carbon date, Oxford, Edinburgh, uh, just outside Glasgow and Belfast. Uh, we approached the lab in uh, just outside Glasgow and um, got them to do the carbon-14 testing which was quite a long process, the most painful bit of which was having to cut out that piece there. Um, I remember taking it in a box and them saying to me, well, actually, we need a decent size chunk to test because there's so much staining that they have to effectively to wash all the staining out first, and that's a destructive process. So it took about 14 weeks of, and I can't remember which order, but there's an acid bath and an alkali bath, which takes out all the... Um, stuff that would be contaminants of the peat particularly, which will give you a false reading. Um, so that they then end up with something that they can then burn and measure the carbon. So that's how it works. As I say, that was the most painful piece. Um, what we did was use a piece adjacent to an area which someone else had cut at some point. There are a couple of very regular cuts, which tells, tells me that someone's kept a piece in some time since the 1980s anyway. So the carbon-14 <coughs> was a long process, 14 weeks, but there were the results. Um, I hope you can see there, it makes sense. So it's measured against um, tree dendrology, that's how they, they measure it, uh, and calibrate it across. Um, what you've got here are the peak points. So as I say, you've got a peak point between 1500 and 1625, but actually the strongest res uh, um, Register is between 1500 and 1600. You can see there we've got what is it, a 95.4% probability of it being um, between 1500 and uh, 1600, and a peak point actually at 1522, with a secondary peak here at uh, I think it's 15, uh, 1620 or something like that. Um, so really, really interesting. At the beginning of the project, as I said, I felt always felt that this was pre 1800. Uh, sorry, pre-1700, but I didn't know whether that was 690 or 6, 1690 or whatever. So to have a period like this was just fantastic. This puts it into a period much earlier than any of the other surviving pieces of tartan, stamp parts of Falkirk tartan, um, in Scotland. And it is therefore the only pre-Jacobite piece of surviving tartan in Scotland. Um, that, that date, you know, so... Um, Roughly 1600, where are we going? Let's take you back to the pattern a second. So looking at the pattern itself, you can see um, what looks like a principally a brown tartan with green and um, brown overchecks on it. But you can see in here, there are slightly darker areas, which were the red squares. So you can see them there. Um, if I just concentrate on that and then take it back, you can see that there's just that... Um, Slightly darker area, those were the areas that have corresponding red. So working with that, bearing in mind that there's a certain um, inconsistency in some of the weaving, i.e. it's not evenly warped. It's quite well woven, actually, um, but it's not evenly uh, warped. So there's some of the green stripes, the um, arrangement of them on, on the ground colour is not necessarily even. So in order to recreate this, 
um, and make a pattern that will repeat. You have to sort of, if you like, standardize the pattern, um, which is what I set about doing. <coughs> um, so there, if you like, is the, uh, a graphic showing just the base pattern, as it were. And that's what happens if you overlay the colors, but not the shades, um, to it. So we've got, we've got red and some sort of yellow, but what shade of red and yellow that, that was, we don't know. Uh, in terms of a commercial production, um, you know, I was looking at doing something that worked, that could be done, that would be acceptable and popular. Um, so there's, there's the pattern aligned to the surviving piece of cloth, allowing, as I say, you can see where I've had to, to regularize the pattern um, to get rid of all the inconsistencies. As I say, um, it's, there are errors in the warping, but none, certainly in this piece, in the actual weaving. The other thing I should say about the, the actual spinning, um, uh, in, in writing a paper about this, um, I was uh, fascinated to realize that this was done before the widespread introduction of the spinning wheel in Scotland. The spinning wheel came in yes, about the same time as this was produced, but actually didn't make it to the Highlands until the early to mid 18th century. So actually this is all hand spun on a drop spindle, a distaff spindle. So beautifully executed. So then a summary here, see if I can see what I've said. So the, the, um, the dye analysis confirmed the presence of indigotin. There are two types of indigotin that were traditionally used here, woad, you know, that of Braveheart, not. Um, but our traditional uh, dye stuff or imported indigo, indigo imported in Scotland from 1603, I think it was. Uh, so it could have just been from here, but um, it's quite likely, given the date of this, that it's actually native woad, which is, or, or possibly imported woad, because we were importing as well. Um, but really interesting to have something that was possibly woad. Actually, the dye stuff that sits behind both of them is the same, so you can't actually measure one and work out which it is. It's the same. Um, so we've got evidence of a red and yellow. As I say, the chemical content wasn't strong enough to allow the identification of those. Um, and then the darker brown, which may or may not have been um, natural, or it may have been a natural dye that was then just top dyed with something like tannin, just to darken it down, which was a standard way of doing it. Carbon-14 then gives us the testing, gave us, oops, come back, gave us uh, a date range there, but with the high probability and confidence that it is um, of the 16th century, which is phenomenal. So I'm talk you're talking about um, the period of James IV, Mary Queen of Scots, uh, James V, Mary Queen of Scots, James I, but not VI. Um, <clears throat> so again, hugely important in terms of the development and understanding of, of Tartan as a Scottish cultural icon. Um, and uh, as I said, the possible sources of the red likely to be mad or something like that, or perhaps a lichen. There were a number of lichens that would give red. Um, further work for this project. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment um, with uh, someone who is a specialist in Tudor sheep breeds. Who, yeah, it's a difficult word to say before lunch. Um, who hopefully will be able to, through a series of photographs of the yarn, tell us what fleece it was. And it'll obviously be an unimproved free breed that no longer exists, possibly something like North Ronald, say, or soy, but we don't know yet. Uh, and more interestingly, the isotope analysis, I'm hoping that we will be able to take just a couple of threads and do the isotope analysis, which will tell us where the sheep was grown, i.e. on the west coast, on the east coast, in the middle of the glen, um, or perhaps somewhere else, we don't know. But that might then help us identify um, where the owner was from, not necessarily, there was always trade going on, etc. cetera. Um, it still leaves a, a number of unanswered questions, of course. Um, uh, Dawn was talking about CADs. So here was a CAD I did, so doing some work with uh, the House of Edgar to do a reconstruction, um, some of the um, royalties from which will help support the authority's work uh, and further research into this. So there's a CAD, um, and that's the final cloth, which is the tartan that James is wearing in his kilt today. Um, nicely done. Um, well done. There's yours truly with it and the original piece. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that interesting. It's a, there's an awful lot to say about it. If you have access to 
textile. Um, I wrote a, a, an article for last month, the uh, last quarter's uh, paper in there, that details far more about the dianalysis, the history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's fascinating about this piece is, is the um, questions, the unanswered questions, probably unanswerable questions that it opens up. You know, how is this buried? Because you don't just drop something like that and it just gets buried. So it was obviously a deliberate act. This was from a time when most people were wearing hodden or lachten or some sort of plain cloth. So this is a status piece at that sort of date, status symbol. Was it male? Was it female? Were they local? Were they a traveler? I should have said that that central part of the Glen didn't have permanent habitation at the time. Yes, in the you know, um, uh, dark, dark ages they did, uh, but it was a summer shielding area for the Mackenzies coming over from um, the West. Um, or was it a traveler? As I say, what circumstances was it buried in? Was it buried whole? Was there more of it? Um, all those sort of things that we will probably never know and can only speculate. Happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for that fascinating Hello. lecture, Peter. Um, I would like to say um, we are a little bit over our time today, so I'd highly encourage anyone to ask any questions to Peter over our lunch, lunch break if that's possible. Yeah, no, that's, fine, that's, fine. Uh, that's grand.